This was the P75 latency of Dropbox in the US. And this is what they got after they did some optimizations. Today, we will talk about what they did and how did they get this performance improvement. Dropbox has an extensive edge network. And what do I mean by that? You see, if Dropbox had just one server in the world, by sheer rule of physics, if the user is sitting very far away from that server, the latency would increase, right? And that is a problem. What did they do to solve this? They have placed a lot of small servers around the world. And this is called the edge network. And Dropbox calls each of these a point of presence or a POP. This obviously makes their site a lot faster than normal. But how do they decide which user should be served by which POP? One obvious solution is to route the user's request to the point of presence nearest to it. So if a user is in Berlin, it makes sense to route his request to Berlin's POP itself. Because this method is the obvious one, this is what they were following earlier. And this is what gave that upper line in the graph that I just showed. Now we want to talk about how they changed this and brought the latency down. There is a problem with the current approach. And this is the example that Dropbox gives us. So there is some user in some ISP network in Berlin, right? Now Dropbox does not have a PNI or a private network interconnection with that user's ISP, which simply means that they don't have a dedicated network connection from their network to that ISP. Thus, to reach the Berlin POP, it has to use a transit provider to connect to the internet and then reach that point of presence via the internet network itself and not some private networks, right? And a transit provider simply means something that helps the ISP connect to the global internet network. And let's say this is happening via Frankfurt, right? So what will happen to this request? First, the request user's request will go to Frankfurt to connect to the internet. Via the internet, it will come to the Berlin's uh, point of presence. Then the response will follow the same path back, right? So this is the diagram that you can see that is currently happening. But here's a twist in the story. Dropbox has a point of presence in Frankfurt too. So if the request just came from Berlin to Frankfurt and was served by Frankfurt's point of presence, then it would have been just one hop and back. We see that even if the Berlin's point of presence was closer to the user geographically, but the latency would be lesser if the user would have used Frankfurt's uh, point of presence. Now look, network topologies are complex. The situations can vary a lot, especially when they're operating worldwide. Keeping this in mind, they thought that instead of geographical closeness, they should send the client's request to the point of presence with the least latency. That's how they can always be sure that they are serving the user in the quickest manner. Now they know that they have to create a map of which user should be routed to which POP based on that latency. Now, how will they create the map? First, they made the desktop client intelligent enough to figure out which POP has the least latency. So let's say now the Dropbox client knows that Frankfurt has the least latency. Now the challenge is with DNS. Like always, it's DNS. When the client sends any request to dropbox.com, the DNS server, which Dropbox controls, has to tell it that this is the IP of the point of presence that you need to connect to. Now, it knows that which client needs to connect to which point of presence that is known by Dropbox. But the DNS server that Dropbox controls this one does not directly get the IP of the client. Instead, it gets the IP of the DNS resolver that the client is using. What they need to do is get a mapping of which client subnet is connected to which DNS resolver. So they need to get this mapping right here. And how do they do that? That's the question. The client application sends DNS queries to random subdomains of Dropbox. Why random? Because they don't want cached data from this DNS resolver. They want a full DNS lookup to happen so that their DNS servers get the request to them. The client also sends the list of the DNS queries it made to the server. So the server gets the list of the requested subdomains from the client. Now the server can match the request it got in its uh, DNS servers and the list it got from the clients. 
this to information helps them to collate a list. So what does Dropbox know with these two information, right? First, it knows that which point of presence have least latencies with which clients that they got in the first step with the client sending requests to multiple uh, point of presence. Now it also knows that which clients are behind which DNS resolver. With this information, they use some transformations on this data, which they haven't mentioned what transformations they are exactly using uh, in the article that they wrote. So I also don't know that. So they find out the best point of presence for each DNS resolver so that it gives best response time to most of the clients behind it. See, this DNS resolver is serving many Dropbox clients. Now the Dropbox server, the DNS server knows that what is the point of presence and what is the IP of that point of presence so that most clients that this DNS resolver is serving gets a very low latency. Now when Dropbox gets a request from that DNS resolver, it sends back the IP of the POP it thinks that is best for most of the clients behind that DNS resolver. And Dropbox uses technologies from NS1 on their DNS servers. So they worked with NS1 and got an ability to upload this mapping in JSON to know that which subnets should be served by which point of presence. And they upload this mapping to the DNS server and it works right for them. So this is what they did and this is their results. You can see there is a drop in latency for the US and Africa regions. Now they got around 10 to 15% latency drop for their users across the uh, globe. And for a company like Dropbox at their scale and their global operations, that drop in latency can mean a lot. If you read their blog, which I've linked in the description, you will be able to see some more example and some more metrics and some more even outrageous edge cases that they solve. With this, let me end this video. Leave a like if you think the content is good and write in the comments what you liked and didn't like about this video. Subscribe if you want to see more engineering videos like this. Thanks and see you in the next video.